1958, a little agency you might have heard of was officially formed. And in 60 years since, that agency has done some really amazing things, such as sending the first humans to walk on the surface of the moon, exploring Mars, imaging planets in our solar system, and probing into the far reaches of space. If you haven't guessed it, that little agency is called NASA. But fewer people know that when NASA was founded, one of its initial goals was to study something much closer to home. When President Eisenhower signed the Space Act in 1958, he charged this agency with a very important task, to study the Earth from space to advance scientific understanding and use that information to benefit society. My name's Dan Irwin, and I'm a NASA scientist. I lead an amazing team called Severe. And today, I want to talk to you about the power of perspective and how what we can see from space through a constellation of Earth-observing satellites developed by NASA, by space agencies around the world, and even the private sector are helping us improve and solve major challenges here on Earth. Now, why Earth? And this is a serious question. Well, you are here, we are here, we're here today together. But humans have been looking up to the stars and to the skies for thousands of years, asking what it all means. How does the sun affect the harvest? How, do the, how does the moon affect the tides? And even the end date of civilization, now fortunately that one hasn't happened quite yet, but only in the past five or six decades, have we been able to look back down through this constellation of satellites to take pioneering observations of our home planet, to monitor its health, and ultimately understand the Earth as a system. In 1993, 20 years before the end of the Maya calendar, and actually really just the close of the 13th Bakhtun, I was living and working in the lowlands of Guatemala, helping to map the Maya Biosphere Reserve, the largest protected area north of the Amazon. It was an amazing experience. Mapping the jungles in your 20s sounds really romantic. And it was, at times. And you also encounter big snakes and scorpions. And in the lower picture, those are ticks crawling up my leg. And another great use for duct tape wrapping the sticky side out, you can get them all off. I later joined a team at NASA doing space archaeology, using satellite data to find unrecorded Maya archaeological sites that had been hidden under the jungle for thousands of years. And the reason we could do this is because with satellite data, we could detect the stress in the vegetation and use that as an indicator for temples, plazas, causeways, and even house mounds. But not to miss the forest for the trees. Satellites let us look at things at a much larger scale. In this 1989 Landsat satellite image, this was one of the main reasons that the reserve was set up that enabled the Guatemalan Congress to quickly support this idea and ultimately resulted in me going down there. What you're actually looking at is a political boundary from space. Mexico had cut down their trees, and Guatemala had not. And it was a call for action for Guatemala to do something so it didn't happen on their side of the border. And this new reserve and this single image not only resulted in the new reserve being set up, but it brought the president's of Guatemala and Mexico together for the first time in 120 years to end tensions along that border. Today, despite all kinds of pressures, the Maya Biosphere Reserve is still the largest intact tropical forest north of the Amazon. As you may know, our planet is facing unprecedented challenges. Fires are becoming more frequent and intense. Droughts are affecting crops and destroying livelihoods and floods are becoming more and more frequent. 
Now, for the doomsday preppers in the crowd, there's no need to worry. The, the world isn't ending quite yet. But big problems require really big solutions, and we have to radically rethink and use the power and perspective of space to help us solve these real pressing problems right here on Earth. Astronaut Ron Guerin, who spent six months gazing down on our beautiful planet, he coined the term the orbital perspective. He basically saw that with the exponential increase in technology, we have now a highly interconnected global society that's enabling us to work together, collaborate together, and solve problems like we've never done before. And in the spirit of the orbital perspective, and based on my experience in Guatemala, I have been on a 20-year mission to connect space to village. I co-created a program called Servir, which is Spanish and French to serve, which is ultimately what we do with data, knowledge, and converting it into actionable information to help people around the world and to ultimately help fulfill that founding goal of NASA. Servir is a global network of regional hubs in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, empowering over 50 countries to use satellite data to address their most pressing needs related to food, water, land cover change, climate. With hubs, with local staff in those hubs in Colombia, in Kenya, in Nepal, in Niger, in Thailand, with the Science Coordination Office of the entire network right here in Huntsville, Alabama. We're helping all of these countries use information, use data from space to solve these really pressing problems. And this is possible because of an unlikely partnership between perhaps two of the most different yet complementary agencies in our federal government, NASA and the U.S. Agency for International Development. At NASA, we work in space. We travel into space. We use the unique vantage point of space to look back on our home planet. At USAID, they work in over 100 countries around the world. They understand development. They understand the social side. But only by working together and with our partners around the globe can we do extraordinary things that none of us can do alone. I'd like to share with you a few examples of how satellites can shift our perspective, change our thinking, and ultimately improve the world. In Asia, fires are, are burning more and more. We've heard the stories in, in the Amazon. We see it all over our globe. Tens of thousands of hectares are burned every year. And these fires are destroying livelihoods, they're destroying community-managed forest plantations. Every red dot that you see in that image is a fire hotspot detected by satellite. And again, we're doing the same thing in the Amazon. These technologies let us see the world in ways we've never been able to see it before. And we're using this information to monitor. And it's one thing to monitor, but then how do you take action? And if we go back to Nepal, our severe hub there, recognizing that we have these new technologies in space, they built a capability, an app basically, that whenever the satellite passes over, it would detect a fire, and it would send that information to the telephones of district forest officers who would then alert vulnerable communities, the army, the local police, and enable people to take action. And Nepal's not just using it to look at where the fire's now for response, but they're using it for preparedness. They're looking at fire trends and helping to prepare for future years. In the United States, insurance is widespread to help out with perils such as floods and fires and hail and crops. And this is because we have really good, high quality data of losses. But in places like Kenya, that didn't exist. And a farmer and his family could be one bad drought away from going broke 
or going hungry. So our severe hub in Kenya recognized that the government was trying to make a nationwide crop insurance, but they were using traditional field-based methods and they weren't getting very far. So we introduced them to do it by satellite data. And they realized that using satellite data, it resulted in a 70% cost reduction. Three years ago, 900 people were insured. Today, nearly half a million. And floods are the costliest natural disaster, affecting 250 million people a year, resulting in, on average, $10 billion in economic loss. And in places like Laos, you might have heard this in the news, last year there was a dam break. But what a lot of people don't know is that an event in one country can affect other countries, and these countries aren't sharing their water information. So the dam breaks in Laos, but downstream is Cambodia, and they don't share their information. So using satellite, we effectively can do near real-time surface water monitoring and share that information with communities downstream to get them out of harm's way. And again, it's not just looking at disasters as they occur, but it's becoming more prepared as a global society and taking advantage of NASA's four-decade record of our home planet and using that and looking at historical, uh, uh, historical flood trends and then being able to help stage flood relief prior to the monsoon season. Becoming more prepared is ultimately what it's all about. And another severe initiative is a camera that we created for the International Space Station to make the International Space Station even more international. Hear me again. It's an International Space Station, but making it even more international. And that's by serving less served countries that can use this data from space to help with the many problems that they're facing. The camera was installed by astronaut Chris Hadfield and we called it the International Space Station Severe Environmental Research and Visualization System. Our NASA management was really happy because we took two acronyms to make a third acronym. But we took over 100,000 images of our planet, of disasters, of environmental hotspots, of other areas such as this one of the San Quintin Glacier in Chile, in northern Patagonia. And you can see that the glacier is shrinking and you can see the calving of that glacier and the retreat from the terminus where it was in 1987. But ultimately, it's about bringing information from space back down to Earth and making it useful and making it actionable and making it valuable for people around the world. Servere is more than just a group of scientists and a group of researchers, but it's a global community working together to solve problems and co-develop solutions. We empower women. We empower teachers. We empower government officials. We help with inspiring the next generation in places like Kenya where we sponsor student challenges or coding camps for women in science in places like Malawi and Namibia. The ancient Maya were perhaps one of the most advanced civilizations in human history. They could calculate phases of the moon, predict the recurrence of eclipses, predict the appearance and disappearance of Venus as the morning and evening star. They built enormous cities, majestic temples. But around 800 AD, something terrible happened their civilization collapsed. We now know that to grow their cities, to feed their population, they cut down most of their trees. And that, together with regional effects, caused clouds to form higher and later in the day, resulting in less rainfall. The Maya typically had an 18-month supply to the reservoirs, and they dried up. And famine ensued. Effectively, the Maya changed their environment. The Maya were brilliant, but perhaps they lacked 
the power of perspective and the ability to connect space to village. I often ask, had the Maya had the ability to see and understand what was happening to their environment and take an action, would they have shared a different fate? Today we have that ability. What matters is what we do with it. Thank you.